we have a partly Earth-directed solar storm, flare activity picking up, and a big flare player on the sun's far side looks to be surviving its far side passage. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week picks up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we have a lot of active regions in Earth view, but we also have a lot of filaments. These are the worm-like structures that could actually erupt into solar storms. We've been paying attention to several of them that have been rotating through the Earth strike zone, like this one here, this one down here, and this one as well that's just beginning to rotate into the Earth strike zone. In fact, as you can see, late on the 5th, whoosh right there it launches as a solar storm as we take a look at it in coronagraphs you can see that big kind of partial halo right here launching mainly to the southeast of earth but it does look like there's an earth directed component so we're going to get back to that in a minute now as we continue watching this re this uh, filament launch kind of set off a little chain reaction as you can see here you'll see a bam bam boom and boom right there. Both of those little eruptions didn't really send off big solar storms, but they are tied to this other filament that we've been watching very carefully. So we're keeping our close eye on it as it rotates through the Earth strike zone. On top of that, region 3599, this region has begun to become a big flare player. In fact, it fires off a reasonably large, not quite M-class flare here just the other day, and it looks like it's continuing to grow. In fact, region 3602 is also beginning to get in the fray because shortly after this flare, watch region 3602, it launches, do you see that poof? It launches is a non-Earth directed solar storm off to the uh, to the west of Earth. So we're not going to get hit by that, but it sure looks like both of these two regions could give us more big solar flares. And uh, as they continue rotating in through the Earth strike zone, they could give us some more solar storms. So we are keeping our eyes on them. Now, as we take a look at our M flare and dayside radio blackout threat meter, you can see that X ray flux has been sitting above the sea floor over this past week. We have been popping a few flares, but not a lot. And the reason for this is because we're kind of in that dead zone. We have a few regions that have rotated to the sun's west limb, and there are some on the sun's far side. But on the front side, everything's pretty quiet, except for, as you notice, starting around the 7th, we started getting a bit more flare activity, and this is due to region 3599. As you can see, it's almost popped up to the R1 level radio blackout. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders Get ready, they're gonna get a little bit more noise on the bands because this flare activity could definitely continue. We are seeing this region grow a bit. So expect uh, radio blackouts to be on the menu on Earth's day side this week. Now switching to our solar storm conditions, over this past week, we've been hovering between unsettled and even quiet conditions, except for when we got hit by what we thought was gonna be a glancing solar storm blow. This storm hit us hard. In fact, wham! Look at that. Not only did it bump us up to storm levels, it bumped us up to G2 level solar storm conditions. And when this happened, the night side was on or Australia and New Zealand's end of the earth. So they got the best shows in the house. And then we got some decent shows in Russia and the UK and Europe. But by the time that this solar storm ended up having the night side being in the Western Hemisphere, well, look what happened. It kind of fizzled out. So we only got active conditions, so aurora views died very quickly. As you can see, we went right back down to unsettled and quiet conditions. And that's the way it's been over this past week or so. And uh, except as we get to the night, we're going to be expecting a solar storm glancing blow again. So you never know. If you're at high latitudes, you aurora photographers, you could definitely get a chance to see aurora. If you're at mid latitudes, 
well, you know, maybe we'll get another repeat performance, so it might be worth a look. And although this G2 level solar storm didn't last for all that long, there were some amazing aurora shots seen in many parts of the world. And I thank all of you aurora field reporters for sharing your shots with me. I can't possibly show them all, but I will give you some highlights this week, and I'll give you more highlights when I do another solar storm forecast in the future. So here are some gorgeous shots from southern and western Australia. There were lots of pictures from there. And we had gorgeous shows in New Zealand. An aurora was seen in Tasmania. And as we flip to the Northern Hemisphere, aurora was seen in Russia. And it was seen in Estonia. And we had gorgeous shows in Poland. And as we move over into the UK, it was seen in Scotland. And in lots of places in Ireland. We also saw it down in England and clear down in Wales. And it was seen as far south as Germany. And as we move over the pond, it was seen a little bit in the United States. We saw a bit of it in Maine and also Massachusetts. Now, taking a closer look at that solar storm that's on its way to Earth, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we set this solar storm model in motion, you can see that solar storm being launched mainly to the east of Earth, but also to the south of Earth. Yet look at this little finger that's kind of poking up a little bit. That finger actually looks like it's going to impact Earth. NOAA has it impacting us right about early on the 9th. And that means that we could be getting a little bit of aurora, not just starting on the 9th, but a little bit ahead of that because we have a fast solar wind stream just ahead of that solar storm right there. And that could be giving us a little bit of intensity. We're already seeing a little bit of that fast solar wind effect uh, in the solar wind now. So aurora photographers, if you're at uh, high latitudes, definitely could get a show on the 8th and through the 9th. If you're at mid latitudes, well, the 9th is probably a better shot, but definitely keep your batteries charged. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, we can no longer rely on Stereo A imagery because Stereo A is looking at the same side of the sun as we are. So we have to rely on uh, HMI and AIA imagery of about two weeks ago to see what's lurking on the sun's far side. And as we take a look, we do have region 3586 and 3593 those are going to be the regions that are rotating into Earth view in a few days, but they're really pretty quiet. The big region to watch, though, is region 3590. Remember, this region was a big flare player about a week ago, and it looks like it's beginning to survive its far side passage. In fact, as we take a look at our JSOC HMI helioseismology far sided monitor, you can see here are these regions on the, the sun's front side about you know a week or so ago. Here's region Region 3590 as it rotates to the sun's far side. And look at this dark patch. Boy, this region is big. This thing is still, this is like the third time we've seen this region. It manages to survive every single time it rotates to the sun's far side. We don't see a lot of activity in front of it. So over this next maybe three to five days, we're not going to get that much activity. But we, shall, we definitely will be getting more stuff from region 3590 as it rotates into Earth view in a little bit more than a week. Plus, we have these other active regions that are just rotating into the onto the sun's far side. These are the regions that are reasonably new. They only uh, grew based basically uh, the last maybe week or so before they rotated out of Earth view. So these regions will be fun to watch to see whether or not they continue to grow because they might be big flare players as well. But we're going to have to wait more than a week to see them. So we're going to have to just sit tight. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon with the new moon being on the 10th. So Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora from a solar storm, well, now is your perfect chance.
Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that solar storm that's supposed to be a glancing blow on the 9th. And prior to that, we're going to be expecting some fast solar wind uh, that's going to be just kind of like a one-two punch here. So at high latitudes, NOAA's expecting minor storm conditions. In fact, we're expecting up to about a 60% chance of major storm conditions by the 9th but then things should be kind of settling down a little bit right around the 10th and into the 11th. We're going to be getting into some nice fast solar wind and then things will calm on down. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show over the 8th and the 9th and possibly the 10th. It should be a decent level of showing. May not be the brightest or the strongest. We're not expecting G2 levels here, but you could get some decent shows. Now at mid latitudes, well, we're only expecting active conditions, but again, this could be on the 8th and the 9th. We're going to be doing a storm watch on the 8th. We're only expecting maybe a 20% chance of minor storm conditions, but by the 9th, maybe 25% chance. So Aurora photographers, if you're daring down at mid latitudes, uh, you could definitely take a look, but things should be settling down by the 10th and by the 11th going into Monday and Tuesday, things should be back to being pretty quiet. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting in the triple digits. We're around, uh, hovering around 140 to 145 for solar flux. So that means good radio propagation on Earth's dayside. We're definitely going to stay in that range. We have dropped down to minor noise on the bands. In fact, we were down even a little bit quieter than that. But region 3599 has become a big flare player. So NOAA is giving us about a 20% chance of uh, M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even a 5% chance uh, of, for, of X-class flares at the R3 level radio blackout. This will be over the next three days, and I've kind of extended that out for the five day, because it's kind of hard to tell exactly what region 3599 is going to be doing. I imagine it's going to kind of hover about where it is, and we don't have region 3590 rotating into Earth view yet. That's going to be in about a week, so likely conditions are going to remain right about where we are. So amateur radio operators expect a bit of noise on the bands and possibly a radio blackout here or there, but it shouldn't be all that bad. Now, switching to your radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Well, everything is in the green this week. We are sitting at the D1 normal range, and that's at flight level 360 for you aviators, which is also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. We, uh, we do have about a 5% chance of a radiation storm at the S1 to S2 level, and that'll be over the next three days. That might actually rise a little bit, up to about 10% as we move into the early part of next week and that's because of region 3599 rotating to the sun's west limb and that always makes that risk for radiation storms rise just a, a, a smidge but things shouldn't be too bad so all overall uh, you frequent flyers and this does include air crew and you high risk passengers it looks like this week you're going to all be in the clear so the space weather this week has picked up just a little bit. We do have a partly Earth-directed solar storm that's going to give us a glancing blow right around the 9th. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, well, you know, the show may start for you right around the 8th because we're having some fast solar wind effects ahead of that storm. So you could see Aurora starting around the 8th and into the 9th. That should be when it peaks, and you might even get a little bit of a show right around the 10th before things calm down. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, you know, glancing blows of if it's anything like the last one we had, it actually might be a better show than we think. So it might be worth a look, especially on the night. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, things are quieting down a bit on Earth's day side this week. We only have one flare, big flare player in Earth view, and it's really not that exciting. Uh, it's been giving us, you know, minor radio blackouts, but not really all that much. More like noise on the bands. So just appreciate this reprieve because in about a week, it looks like things will change and we'll get those big radio blackouts again. And now for you GPS users, well, you know, GPS right now is probably looking pretty decent on Earth's day side. We're not having those big radio blackouts, but you might need to be uh, vigilant anywhere near dawn and near dusk because that's when GPS reception is always a little bit dicey anyway. Plus, on Earth's night side, when that solar storm hits, be vigilant anywhere near Aurora. And if you're a drone flyer, definitely calibrate your magnetometer often. 
I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.